Hi, my name is Kim Gwider, and if you've seen some of the previous tutorials, you know I coach college softball for a number of years at the Division I and Division II level. And today what I'd like to talk to you about is, when does the recruiting process of a student athlete actually start? Well, let me give you some insight from my years of coaching. First of all, college coaches will tell you that recruiting's happening earlier and earlier. The top Division I softball programs have lists of players as young as the 8th and 9th grade. It's not unheard of to have a player verbally commit in the 10th grade. Now, in one of the later tutorials, I'm going to give you my opinion on that, but that's for later on. Currently, one of the biggest recruiting tournaments in the country, and by being one of the biggest recruiting tournaments, I mean where you will see the most college coaches, is the ASA 16 and under nationals, not the ASA 18 gold. The reason being that at Gold Nationals, all but a very few of the players are either verbally committed or signed already to a college. Now remember, Division I is only one option. There are other types of schools that offer very challenging opportunities to play softball, and they, all, and they offer scholarship money as well. I remind parents all the time that not every player needs to play Division I, and finding that right fit for your daughter is really the most important thing. The reality of the college softball recruiting process is the following. Here are some realities. When I was a college softball coach, I would get hundreds of letters, now it's emails, videos, and other communications throughout the year. The days before a major showcase tournament, the numbers of emails was staggering. And here's another thing. Most of the time, I didn't look at them. I would forward them to my overworked young assistant to put in a database. I would have my assistant look at the tapes or videos or emails, whatever it was, and only give me the ones that they thought were outstanding. And I'll be honest, what would happen a lot of the time is my assistant would maybe look at the first 30 seconds, and if nothing caught their eye, they would take it out and start a new tape because they would have a box of them to look through. I would print out this database that was created and bring it with me to tournaments, but I did not base my choices of who I was going to see on that database. So the question ends up being, how did I decide who I was going to see? Other emails, letters, and profiles that came from recruiting services, I usually just deleted or threw in the trash, which is kind of interesting that now I run a recruiting company. If a player did not show me a personalized effort in contacting me, they became a very low priority. Emails that came with my name spelled wrong or the wrong coach or the wrong college, they were immediately deleted, thrown in the trash, whatever, whatever. Um, but that's why later on we talk about emailing a college coach. It's very important how you do that. So how did I choose the players I was going to go and see? How did I create my must-see list for a recruiting season? Here were some of my keys for that. First off, a player had to fit my needs in that recruiting class. That seems kind of obvious. If I didn't need a pitcher, I wasn't going to recruit one. You have to have a full team. You've got to have all the positions covered. Uh, you can't have all pitchers. You can't have all catchers. So even though your daughter might be a great pitcher, maybe I have a couple of pitchers. She's not a good fit for me. I had to look at my scholarship budget and figure out what players I could get based on the money I have available. Some schools have in-state scholarship money. Some schools have out-of-state scholarship money. Some have a mixture of both. I had to figure out what type of monies I had and what players I could go after based on that. Maybe I didn't have a full scholarship. Maybe I only had a portion of a scholarship. So I had to look at other things like academic criteria or financial aid. At the Division II level, financial aid was a huge thing I had to look into when it came to recruiting athletes because the private school I was at was very expensive. So without financial aid, it was very difficult to get a student athlete to uh, pay the bills. I would talk to uh, summer coaches and high school coaches that I respected, and I would get their input at who the good players were around and what they thought of them. I would also try and find out who the problems were, and I would stay away from them. I would glance at the emails and the profiles I received and look at the personal highlights. If there was something that caught my eye that made a player stand out, I would have my assistant look at them more closely. Awards did matter to me, especially the absence of them. You would expect to see a player have all counties, and if they weren't there, uh, that kind of threw up a flag to me. Um, all these kinds of things, uh, whether it came to speeds and times, you would take them with a grain of salt. You would see a lot of times every pitcher would throw 60 miles an hour, so that wasn't unusual. Uh, if a player sent me multiple communications, I did notice that. And it mattered to me if they really had a desire to play for my specific program. So again, we talk about this idea of personalizing these emails to a college coach. It did matter to me that they knew about my program and they wanted to come to my school. 
players, and here's a really, really important thing. How to make it off a coach's list fast, and this is going to come up in several of my tutorials. And I bet if you ask most college coaches, you'll hear this. A player would make it off my list very quickly if I saw a poor attitude on the field. Disrespectful to a coach, lack of hustle, jogging ground balls, um, being disrespectful to parents. I mean, coaches watch everything. Here's the bottom line. Most college coaches don't get paid a ton of money. So and they want to have players that they enjoy coaching. They don't want to have problems. So it's really important to show a good attitude and to have a good attitude as well in the recruiting process. Now, making a college coach's list to be seen is only the first step in the process. You have to remember that there are a lot of players out there, and you need to maximize your chances of being seen by a college coach at a school you see yourself attending or have your daughter sees herself attending. You should not leave this to chance and hope to be discovered. We talked about this in our earlier video of what I think the biggest mistake you can make in the recruiting process is. Just because you attend these showcase tournaments doesn't guarantee that you're going to get seen by a college coach. Think of all the players out there. Now, in our next tutorial, we're going to talk about how you can maximize your chances to be seen by a college coach of a school that your softball player is interested in attending.